So in the spirit of learning and challenging, it's my great pleasure to introduce uh, Larry Kramer uh, and his keynote purpose, Is It Enough? Uh, Larry has been the president of the William and Flora Hewlett Foundation since 2012. And under his leadership, the foundation has maintained its commitment to areas of enduring concern while adapting its approaches and strategies to meet changing circumstances and seize new opportunities. He has at the same time been instrumental in launching new efforts to respond to pressing and timely problems, such as uh, those related to political po polarisation and cyber security. Since joining the Hewlett Foundation, he has written and spoken about issues related to effective philanthropy, including the importance of collaboration among funders and the need to provide grantees with long-term support. Before joining the foundation, Larry served from 2004 to 2012 as the Richard E. Lang Professor of Law and Dean of Stanford Law School. His teaching and scholarly interests include American legal history, constitutional law, federalism, uh, uh, separation of powers, the federal courts, conflict uh, of laws and civil procedure. Larry served as a law clerk to the US Court of Appeals Judge Henry J. Friendly of the Second Circuit and US Supreme Court Judge William J. Brennan, Jr. Uh, he serves as a director on boards of a number of nonprofit organizations, including uh, the National Constitution Center, the Independent Sector, and the Climate Works Foundation. Will you please join me in welcome, welcoming Larry to Australia and the conference today. Thank you for the uh, nice introduction and welcome everybody and thank you for uh, inviting me here. It's really an honor to, to be here. I, I, just, I have to preface this with a couple of things uh, that I've picked up since I got here. So first, Christian said to me, you know, you should be informal, move around. We kind of like it to look like a TED talk. I hate TED talks. <laughs> I do. I, to me, they're kind of, I hate to say it, I said this to Christian, they're kind of emblematic of many things that I think are wrong with current contemporary intellectual culture. Um, so among other things, there will be no slides. I've never used a slide uh, in my life. Um, second, I do want to apologize up front because I, one of the reasons I came here was to learn more about Australia and Australian philanthropy. So it is my first trip. I don't know uh, anywhere near as much as I should about either the country or philanthropy. So I'll be speaking from the perspective of the US. And so if anything I say sounds arrogant, please, it is not meant to be. Um, I want to talk about the role and the place of, of philanthropy. Oh, one last uh, preface. I, I also have some notes here. Um, when I was dean, I, I gave some speeches early on, and one of my faculty members, a woman named Barbara Babcock, who was easily the best speaker I've ever met, came up to me after one of them, and she said, you know, when, when you speak, you have a choice. You can speak from the heart, or you can speak from notes, and you should speak from notes. <laughs> so I have notes. So I want, to, I want to talk about the role and the place of philanthropy uh, in society and, and, and some ways to think about the privileges and responsibilities and obligations uh, of doing that. And although I um, have the privilege of working for what is a large foundation, uh, what, what I say, in my view, applies equally to, to philanthropists of any size or scale. Um, in broad strokes, the privilege and responsibility are, are essentially the same thing. Right? It's, it's to use, many of us have been privileged either to acquire or in my case to have the opportunity to steward um, uh, uh, large resources for the betterment of, of humankind. Um, and that's essentially the heart of it. Uh, it is though important to maintain some perspective about what we can and cannot do. That is to say, what is the realistic role and limits of, of philanthropy, because there is often talk about how you know, we're going to bend the arc of history toward justice and cure global poverty and eliminate racism and, and so on. And you know, the truth is the resources available to philanthropy globally are, are minuscule by comparison to the kinds of problems uh, that need to be addressed and that we actually, actually work on. And that's particularly true, not just in and of itself, but when you compare the resources available to us to those available to the other two chief devices uh, for addressing those problems, which is to say government uh, and, and, and markets, the private sector. Um, so you know, those devices can achieve a kind of scale that is almost unheard of and impossible for philanthropic organizations uh, to do on their own. Just, just think of some of the budget numbers. Um, last year in the United States, uh, organized philanthropy um, made grants of about $40 billion altogether. And that seems like a lot of money until you realize that, for instance, the K-12 budget in California alone 
was something like $78 billion. And uh, the, the global GDP last year was something like, I wrote this number down, $135 trillion. That's last year alone, which makes all of the philanthropy equivalent to something like 0.0006% um, of, of global GDP. So, so we really are talking about a, a tiny little amount of resources to address globally major, major issues. On the other hand, uh, both markets and governments are limited structurally in what they can do and how they can do things, right? So for-profit businesses, for instance, are, are limited by the fact that they're for-profit. Uh, and that's inherently a limitation. There's, there's an additional layer that's been put over that uh, basically since the 1970s, which is you know, what I regard as a deeply misguided notion that the sole purpose of a for-profit entity should be to maximize the value to its shareholders. Now, that precept is undergoing some, some stress. There have been some, some exceptions to it. We have B Corps now, and, and uh, public benefit corporations. Impact investing is slowly growing as a practice. But all of that still remains really marginal around the edges of of the business world writ large. Um, and in any event, even if you got rid of the neoliberal overlay, th there still would be the fact that you have to stay in business. And doing that inherently imposes uh, a kind of short-term focus on what you're, what you're going to do. Um, in the debate over uh, whether to create foundations in perpetuity, I once uh, debated Jeff Rakes, who made the point that you know, business, very few businesses survive that long. Right? Uh, he said, look at the turn of the 20th century and ask which of the top 100 businesses were still there at the turn of the 21st century, and there were two or three of them. And I think that's true because of the nature of the market. I, I did point out to him that it's not true necessarily for other organizations like universities, which have lasted hundreds of years with endowments, and that foundations perhaps are more like universities than they are like private sector corporations. But that fact about the private sector is worth keeping in mind. Uh, same thing with government. You know, it is an unfortunate, I suppose, but predictable consequence of electoral accountability uh, and competitive elections that you're also going to get uh, inherently just a short-term focus. It is very difficult for government to engage in really long-term planning. It happens rarely, but, but it is rarely. And it's very difficult for government to engage in really risky experimentation, although, again, it does happen. Um, nevertheless, those the sort of short-term focus and the, the difficulty in really engaging in experimentation are an inherent part, I think, of government. Philanthropy, on the other hand, and I'm not telling, I think, anybody here anything you don't already know, is it's often noted free from both market and electoral accountability. So that frees us as funders to do things that these other institutions can't, right? It, it enables us to work with the long term in mind, to develop and run experiments, to take larger risks, and to focus on problems where interested parties are blocking paths to making progress. So we can, in that sense, serve effectively as society's conscience. Right? We can help government and markets get past those limitations if we operate intelligently. Now, that justification for philanthropy, and I think that's the easiest way to see it, then carries with it some of the responsibilities and obligations that are built in. So first, it is, I believe, an obligation and a responsibility to be open and transparent about what you're doing. Right? And that follows from the fact that we are publicly subsidized and democratically unaccountable. So that's a good thing because it frees us to do certain kinds of things. But the very least we can do at that point, given the fact that there is public subsidization of what we're doing, is to be open about what it is and to listen to the communities that we may be affecting. Second is we have a responsibility to pick problems that matter. That is to say, problems to which philanthropy can uniquely contribute. And that means problems that can't or won't be addressed by government or markets, problems that call for risk or experimentation or long-term commitments of some sort. I often say inside you know, my own operation, what's the point of being unaccountable if you don't take advantage of it? <laughs> so I should say, there are lots of found One thing I never understand are foundations that are afraid to do something because they're going to get criticized in the press. OK, criticize. Who cares? Right? I want to listen. Criticism might be right, in which case I should take that into account. But there is no reason for us to be afraid of any of that. That is the point of the unaccountability. And it is our responsibility, then, to take on the things that run those kinds of risks. So it's not just the risk of not succeeding. It's also the risk of being unpopular, all those other kinds of things that limit the other institutions from taking steps that need, to, perhaps, to be taken. Now, equally important to picking problems that matter and somewhat intention, I suppose, is picking problems that matter to you. 
okay? There is this movement out there, effective altruism. I assume many of you are familiar with it. There are many things about the effective altruism movement that I think are really admirable. But one of the premises, which is, which is a notion that there's a strict hierarchy of things that philanthropists should focus on, um, and that all philanthropists are obligated to work on the things at the top of that hierarchy before working to the things below it. And I actually just don't agree with that at all. I think that the kind of goods we can do and the kind of bads that we can prevent are effectively incommensurable with each other. They're apples and oranges. They're the, reducing global poverty to save lives is unquestionably a noble cause, but so is reducing poverty in Sydney or Melbourne. I mean, Melbourne, right? Uh, so is reducing poverty in New York. So is preserving biodiversity. So is improving education. So is supporting the creation of great art. There are a lot of worthwhile causes, even within the constraints of what it is that philanthropy can uniquely do. And I do believe that the best philanthropy is motivated by passion. So although purpose may not be enough, it is the place to start. Right? An entirely passionless, rational philanthropy is unlikely to be as committed, as creative, or as forceful as rationality motivated by genuine passion. I, a quick aside here, when I was an academic, this is uh, related, not the same point, but there's a debate in politics also about whether democratic politics should be based entirely on reason or not. And I got into an argument with one of my colleagues about this, who was arguing that it should be based on reason. This is one strain in the deliberative democracy literature. And at some point in the argument, he was like red in the face, screaming at me about how important it was to take all the emotion out of politics. <laughs> Emotion and passion are a really important part of what it is to be human and, and in guiding rationality. You don't want to be guided by that alone, but it is absolutely a part of it. So note that good philanthropy is about more than just passion. Not all problems are equal, and your choice of problems should come from an informed passion. It should not be just whims or frivolities. You should pick from among the many problems that objectively matter the one or ones that matter to you. But that itself should be based on, and you have an obligation to do research, to listen to others, to learn as much as you can and make those informed choices. When I, when I went to Hewlett and was interviewing for the job, the board asked me, so what do you think about the problems that Hewlett works on? And I said to them, well, you know, it seemed, Hewlett, you had, there were five program areas. It says to me, I said, you know, it seems to me you've picked five of the 25 areas that can plausibly claim to be in the top 10. And that's pretty good. You know, I, we're not really going to do much better than that by arguing back and forth about whether we should be doing something a little different. So I am perfectly content to work on those problems. Now, one other thing about that approach to problem choosing, which is to say, pick the problems that matter to you, although informed and from within a broad frame of the kinds of things where philanthropy can uniquely contribute, is that it also takes advantage of philanthropy's inherent pluralism. And I think that is uh, really important. It's a pivotal aspect of ensuring the democratic legitimacy of what we do. So openness and transparency is one response to the, to the fact that we are unaccountable. But so too is, is having a sector that is itself pluralistic. I think it would be much more problematic if in fact the entire sector lined up behind any one thing to then be unaccountable either to the community through a market mechanism or through a political mechanism. But we're not. And so one of the ways to ensure that we do that is, is a degree of independence on the part of everyone. OK. Second, just picking an area to work on or a problem to work on is not enough. The resources that you have, the resources that you're stewarding are, are, as I mentioned before, rare, they're precious, they're tiny compared to the scale of the problems that you're trying to address. So it's not enough just to do philanthropy. You have to do it effectively. There's an immense amount of bad philanthropy out there. Right? There's a lot of philanthropy that's being done thoughtlessly, without any vision, without any real plans. Where I come from, there are new philanthropists with, I'm going to say this, vast amounts of money coming in every day with no idea what they're doing and no real interest in learning how to do it better. That is why I do think there is an obligation to learn how to do philanthropy as well as to learn what you should be doing. They are distinct things. It is important to focus on both. When I, when I got to it, I had no background in philanthropy. I'd been an academic my whole life. I spent my first, entirely, my first year reading, 
going around meeting the other people who were doing philanthropy, the academics who'd been working on and trying to understand as much as I could about the history. I would say it was not until my fourth year that I really felt like I, I knew what I was doing. I was lucky I was inside an institution that you know operated pretty well. I could have actually been hit by a bus and nobody would have noticed for six months or so. Uh, it gave me the space in which to learn, but that learning I think is pivotally important. Um, and and that, that task never, never stops. Uh, and, and the fact of the matter is philanthropy is not easy. It is a trade. It's a task that combines art and science that requires thoughtfulness and planning and creativity. So that's what we mean when we say strategic philanthropy, that philanthropy needs to be strategic, nothing more, nothing less than working thoughtfully to do philanthropy effectively to achieve our goals. Now, there's a big debate around the uh, phrase strategic philanthropy and what does it mean and a lot of criticism. So let me just say at its heart, strategic philanthropy consists of three very simple propositions. One, you should have a clear goal in mind, right? You should have an articulated and articulable goal of what it is you're trying to accomplish. Two, you should have a story about how it is you're going to accomplish that goal, about how you're going to get from here to whatever that goal is. This is sometimes referred to as a theory of change. Fine, good, good, good phrase. It's still just a, a causation story about how what you are going to do is going to bring about the outcomes that you're trying to achieve. And three, you should have a way to measure whether or not you're making progress toward that goal. Okay, now I want to say a few more words about each of those things. So let me start with setting a, a, a goal that's articulate, articulated and articulable. So in my view, that goal should be ambitious. But you do want to distinguish between sort of your broad programmatic goals and the specific strategic goals you're after. So for instance, we have an education program. We say that our education program's goal is to provide uh, students with the skills they need to succeed in careers, life, and citizenship. Well, OK, that's, that is a goal. That, that's not a very useful goal in the sense of actually doing philanthropy. So within that, we have specific strategies that we think promote that broad programmatic goal that have ambitious but articulable goals. So for instance, we are currently running two strategies, one we call deeper learning, one we call open educational resources, or OER. The deeper learning strategy is uh, to change the culture of the classroom so that Teachers, rather than focusing on just content, are teaching students six competencies. Problem solving, critical thinking, learning to learn, communication, collaboration, and development of an academic mindset. Um, we look to achieve those specific competencies in 15% of the students in 15% of the classrooms by we have a date for that, and then we'll move on from there. Okay, that is a clear goal for what we're trying to accomplish. Similarly, with open educational resources, we have a goal. Open educational resources are online free materials that can be repurposed in whatever way you want without needing to pay anyone or get permissions. You usually have to have attribution, but otherwise you can rework the materials as you wish. Our goal is to turn those into the default in education so that instead of traditional hard textbooks being what people use with an occasional use of open educational resources, that's flipped. So classes are taught with open educational resources, although occasionally there may be a reason to default to some other kinds of, of materials. Um, in our environment program, on the conservation side, we have a goal, the broad goal of the program is to preserve biodiversity in the open spaces of the North American West. Well, okay, that's a little broad, so we have actually developed strategies underneath it, one around land conservation, one around river preservation, in which we look for specific kinds of protections on specific amounts of land. We've actually targeted half of the, uh, we divided the American West into 23 biozones, and we've targeted half of each of them for long-term protection. Not full protection necessarily, different kinds of protection depending on, on the land. So those are, as I say, those are, those are pretty ambitious, um, but they are articulated and you can understand what it is that you're trying to accomplish with them. We advance them in chunks. So we typically do this in five-year chunks, checking in every five years to see where we are and do we need to make changes uh, in, in a full way with an outside evaluator and so on. Okay, so that's developing a goal. Developing a theory of change, or the story, is, is simpler to explain. It, it's essentially you know, a causal story. I think everybody understands what that is. The key here is just to do research. It means understanding what is known about the field, 
It means talking to your potential grantees. It means talking to, in particular, the intended beneficiaries of the work to make, as, as uh, somebody said in one of the opening remarks, to make sure that what you're doing is actually something the community wants and agrees on and, and thinks you're going after in the right way. It means especially talking to other funders because there is nothing worth accomplishing that any of us is going to accomplish by ourselves. Um, it means developing a story together with all of those, with all of those, uh, all of those, all of those entities. And, and again, just to give you a sense, if I come back to the open educational resources strategy for us, that meant thinking through what are the pieces we need to put in place in order to get to the default use. Uh, a lot of the research suggested to us that you could think about OER as one of those kinds of things that falls in the traditional innovation curve, where if you get beyond about 20%, it will take off on its own. We're currently, I should say, at about 14% usage. So what did that mean? First, we needed to support the generation of the materials themselves. We needed systems to make sure that they were of high quality. So that meant third party evaluators of the materials that were being produced. We needed to push the adoption. Now, that was the hardest part as we thought about it. We, we decided the way to do it was to find problems in education that OER materials could solve, not necessarily for the reasons we wanted them adopted, which was to improve educational outcomes, but for something else, typically cost. So for instance, we went to community colleges and said, you know what, 30% of the cost of community colleges and textbooks, if you can line up a whole degree program that I say all the courses in this degree program using OER, you can reduce the cost to your students by 30% without any effect on the educational quality. And so we started working with schools in order to get some of those degree programs adopted. And of course, once they're adopted, because the costs are so much less, students flock to them, and that puts pressure on other professors to, to follow along and do the same thing. So we've looked for problems like that as ways to move from the 14% to the 20%. Um, and on and on. As you see, it was just thinking through, what are all the pieces that need to be put into place for this to happen? And then lastly is measuring progress. So this is, I think, for people who talk about strategic philanthropy, the most misused and misunderstood part of it, because people tend to either do too much of it or too little. Too much meaning they kind of push to extreme absurdities with respect to what it is they're trying to measure, or they don't bother doing it at all. Now, there's no simple one right answer other than you know, a general prescription, which is what is reasonable under the circumstances. If you have no idea what kind of progress you're making, that's a mistake. There's something wrong with your philanthropy. You could just be throwing your money away. It's not responsible. On the other hand, when measurement you know, becomes the thing that completely controls what you're doing, you're letting the tail wag the dog, and that's also uh, misplaced. So finding that sort of happy medium, not being obsessed with numbers when numbers aren't necessarily the right way to do it, being honest with yourself about what you're measuring and what you're learning, that's, that's essentially what you need. And then you, and then you figure it out from where you go. Um, in some areas, like in Western conservation, that one's easy, right? We have miles that we're trying to protect in our climate work. It's tons of carbon going into the atmosphere so we can measure our progress. How many fewer tons are going into the atmosphere than used to be and so on. Um, other programs are not so simple. And so in those, you tend to look for proxies and we ask the question, what would, what would the world look like if we were succeeding, and is it starting to look that way, right? What kinds of institutions would be changing um, if we were succeeding or, you know, and so on. And so those become proxies. And, and as I say, we try and sort of uh, apply a, a reasonableness standard to the whole thing, not give up too soon, but also um, being honest with ourselves if, if we have any idea what we're doing. And it's, it's hard to say much more than that other than take it seriously, be honest with yourself, and you'll be fine. The last uh, aspects of effective philanthropy that I just want to touch on are the overarching ones, which is essentially, this all works pretty well. And again, I think I'm not saying anything you don't all know. If you bring to the work an attitude that what matters most is learning and adaptation. So I actually try never to use the word failure and never to use the word accountability when I'm, when I'm talking inside about philanthropy. I think those are the wrong frames to take to the word. It's not a question of whether we're failing or not. Right? It's a question of whether we are learning. So we set our goals. If we're not achieving them, the question isn't why are we failing? The, the question is what's not working the way we thought it is and what changes can we make to make it work? Now, it's a small adjustment, but it, but it has pretty profound effects. There's this constant discourse about how hard it is to talk about failure. At Hewlett, when I got there, we had a week devoted to talking about failure. We had long sessions about how hard it was to talk about failure. And I, I eventually I said to the staff after one of these, I said, you know, it seems to me the only thing that makes it so hard to talk about failure is how much time we spend 
than talking about how hard it is to talk about failure. It's like going into a room and saying, don't anybody panic. It's the best way to create panic. Let's not work. I don't go through my life asking on everything I do, am I failing or not? I, I have things I'm trying to accomplish. If I'm not accomplishing them, I ask, why not? And if it's the wrong thing, because I'm not ever going to get there, then I'll change. And if it's not, I'll figure out what changes I need to make to do it. And that's the attitude you want uh, in your philanthropy as well. Um, so it's, it's a question of just thinking about it in terms of learning and adaptation as you go along. It's not a failure if you're not getting there. It's that you have misunderstood something and you need to rethink and learn more. Um, and part of the way to do that, and this is the other key aspect, is to develop healthy partnerships with all of the people you need. So that means there's no first and foremost, because it's really healthy partnerships with all of the following, but it means first healthy partnerships with your grantees. Do not treat your grantees like contractors. Develop partnerships and relationships of trust with them. Choose to fund them even within strategic philanthropy because there is alignment between what they are doing and what you want to do. And that only happens if in developing the strategy in the first place, you did it in conversation with them so that your own thinking was shaped by theirs. And then give them general operating support and let them do what they do. Right? That is such an obvious lesson, and it is so seldom followed. It is really, at least in the US, it is really striking to me. Only about 25% of US philanthropy goes in the form of general operating support or unrestricted support. The vast majority of it is this controlling project support that nobody likes and everybody keeps doing. So it's, think about your grantees as your partners, work with them to develop the ideas, and then let them do what they do best. But it's the same thing with maintain an ongoing conversation with the intended beneficiaries and the communities you're trying to help. You need that kind of feedback from them. And particularly, you need it with your funding partners. right? So, so you're not going to accomplish this alone. And if you just settle in on your strategy and basically your idea of partnership is, I am happy to partner with you as long as you do it my way, nothing's ever going to happen. So you have to be open and willing to shape your strategy to some extent to that of the people you want to work with. And they do as well, right? Uh, in order for all of you to succeed. And all that takes is like that small bit of modesty, which says, you know, I think I know pretty well, but I may not know everything and I may not know best. So the other people here, they've also been working on this really hard. They're pretty smart. Let me, let me listen to what they're saying and take it into account as best I can. There is this weird framing thing, you know, when we, we often are thinking about if I hit X, X, if X is on my stat and X comes in with an idea to do something a little differently, we're going to take it seriously in one way. If X is on the staff of another foundation, we treat it totally differently, even though I would perfectly ha be, ha be perfectly happy to hire X to work in my foundation. So why is that? Right? And this is, I say to my staff, just if we know and trust them, the fact that they technically work for another organization is no reason to take what they have to say less seriously if we trust and respect them in terms of what it is they know and what they have to bring to the process. So that kind of attitude, I think, goes very far. Um, so that kind of approach to philanthropy, and it is mostly an attitude, again, it can encompass almost, not almost, can encompass any form of philanthropy, whether it's public policy shaping, which is the bulk of what we do at Hewlett, so-called venture philanthropy, which is right, getting in, in the early stages in small organizations and helping to build them, field building, uh, whatever it is you do. And it also works on any size. It's just an attitude and approach in terms of how you think about what it means to be effective in achieving your goals. And it matters, and it matters today especially because the truth is the world is facing some problems that are massive that are in fact potentially existential at least to our societies so these are problems that are not going to be solved by philanthropy as I said at the beginning certainly not by philanthropy alone but they may not be solved without philanthropy either because they're all characterized by the kinds of limitations that make it difficult for other institutions to address without the kinds of help and interventions that philanthropic support is uniquely capable of providing. So we have a pivotal role, even if it's not sort of, you know, the lead. Um, I said before that you should choose problems in terms of what you care about, that there's no strict hierarchy. And while that's largely true, I think there may be some exceptions. Uh, today, anyway, that is say some problems that are so obviously large and threatening that uh, honestly every philanthropist ought to be thinking about playing a part in them. So I'm going to touch on two of them quickly as we finish here. The two that I think are most critical, and critical because unless we unless we address these successfully, whatever progress we make on other problems is just going to be undone. So I mean, of course, one is the decline of liberal democracy, and two is climate change. So I want to say a few words about each of those.
uh, just to give you a sense. So, so the decline of democracy globally is a trend that's hard to, hard to miss. It's visible in the US election of Trump. In Europe, it's visible in Brexit, in the rise of populist nationalist movements, in successful restrictions on democratic politics in countries as varied as Poland, Hungary, and Israel. It's equally visible in global efforts to restrain and restrict civil society in nations like China, India, across Africa, and even in places like Canada and the US. Nor are the strains in democracy measured only by those sorts of overt and obvious actions and institutional collapses. They're present as well in the paralyzing polarization that is increasingly rendering democratic institutions incapable of acting to address citizens' problems. We see that kind of polarization in extreme forms in the US, but it seems to be growing and popping up across democracies and certainly here in Australia. Even with what little I know, it's hard to miss that. And it's that sort of paralysis that ultimately will fuel the undemocratic movements that will lead to a great deal more suffering and undo a great deal of good unless we prevent it. So uh, 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 don't kid yourselves, I guess I wanna say, right? Australia is on the same path as the US. You're just behind us by a few years. But it's, this is really something that I think needs to be attended to. Now, the underlying causes of the strains on democratic government aren't, aren't difficult to discern. They're well known. Let me just touch on them briefly. We're living through a period of massive economic dislocation and redistribution, a product of global free trade and technological innovation. That has produced enormous and salutary benefits in many parts of the world. But especially in the developed world and Western democracy, it has fueled a massive growth in wealth inequality while leaving large swaths of working class citizens behind, dislocated, and increasingly alienated and angry. Those tensions are all made worse by something that happened at the same time, not necessarily causally related, which is the social transformations uh, that accompanied feminism, racial diversification, and uh, other movements that have fueled the emergence of identity politics, which just raises the tensions and the stakes around all of this. OK, we, all, it's, we know that's been going on. That's not the reason democracies are failing, right? The reasons democracies are failing is that democratic institutions in these countries have proved incapable of addressing the problems. And that is a separate issue and a separate problem, right? The, the, these are the kinds of problems that democratic institutions are supposed to address. So the causes and the cures of the institutional failures within democratic governments are, I, I honestly think, deeply local. Uh, that's, they're a product of institutional arrangements and histories that are particular to each country. So I have no story to tell you about your own country. At Hewlett, we have chosen, we chose in 2012 when I arrived to tackle the problem of political polarization in the US because it was obvious what was going on. I actually wrote a memo to our board in 2012 when I got there saying, you know, the five problems we work on are great, but you're missing this other one which underlies everything because if we're trying to move public policy and you can't move it because our democratic institutions are effectively locked down by polarization organization, we're wasting time and money. Worse, the consequences of that, 2,000 years of history will tell you, is going to be the rise of a demagogue. And you can expect to see that sometime in the next 30 years. And I was off by 26. <laughs> um, but, you know, but the basic diagnosis, I think, I think was right. So let me say a few words about the way we at least are thinking about polarization in the US as a philanthropic strategy. So first, polarization is a conclusion. Right? That is to say, what it reflects is an inability within the democratic institutions to achieve compromises that pops, appears as polarization is the outcome. Nobody on either side is willing to shift a vote or, or join something on the other side. We know that the challenges that are out there, we know we have solutions to them. There are things that could solve these problems. Uh, the problems are not themselves worse than things we've faced in the past, whether it was the Great Depression or the 1960s. They pale by comparison in truth. I mean, there are not huge, difficult problems. We are not entirely without solutions. And the ideological differences between the left and the right are not only not larger, if anything, they're smaller than they were in these past periods. So what's changed is none of that. It's that for some reasons, which we will talk about in a moment, the parties involved, the people in government who are responsible for doing things won't compromise with each other. The, the way political scientists talk about this is what has traditionally been ideological polarization, disagreement around ideas, has shifted into what they call affective polarization, in which this is less about the ideas than it is about tribalism. 
I'm not going to do that because you want to, right? I hate you. <laughs> you are the other team. You are the enemy, right? You are not, you are not a real American or, or, or whatever it is. And, and when you, 94 percent of Americans say they support background checks for guns, but you couldn't get it through Congress because all of the Republican ones were not going to do it if the Democrats wanted it. It was as simple as that wasn't some institutional failure. Republican representatives were actually being, to some extent, responsive to what was going on, which was a reflection of this affective uh, polarization. So it's a product of history. Uh, I'm not going to go into all that here. It's, I'm happy to talk about that with anybody on the side, how we got into this mess. But how do we propose to change it is the more interesting question. So strategic fund, we start with a goal. The goal is to get Congress back to basic functionality, the kind of functionality that is necessary to earn the confidence of citizens. We focused on Congress because it is, in fact, and always has been the key institution in the US constitutional system. It is the one institution capable of reflecting and balancing all of the varied interests across the country. It is the failure of Congress that has provoked all of the other bad effects that produces an expansion of executive power and judicial power and so on. OK, how are we going to do that? What is our theory of change for getting Congress back to functionality? So this one's a little more complicated. Um, but in a nutshell, we start with the idea that in truth, in politics, people take their cues from political leadership much more than the reverse. When it comes to how to behave in politics, people take their cues from how their political leaders behave. And you can see this in the US. The polarization started in Congress, and it has been spreading down and out slowly and now more quickly ever since. You can, you can easily trace this if you, if you follow news polls and so on. Second, the people in Congress actually hate the situation that they find themselves in, unable to compromise, unable to reach agreements, unable to do things with each other. It's, it's a really quite interesting irony, but it makes sense if you think about it. Being a congressman is a terrible job. The hours are awful, the pay is awful, you know, you, you have to you live in like, Three days, of, you're traveling all the time. You're living in your office half the time when you're in DC. It's just, it's not a, people go into this profession because they actually want to do something for the public good. There are a handful of bad actors. There are some people in Congress who really want to shut it down, but that's a relatively small number. And the vast majority on both sides would actually like to get something done. Um, and they can't. So why can't they? And that requires a sort of finding where are the institutional, cultural, structural leverage points that can be moved in order to recreate space for them to begin to compromise on the understanding that once they begin to do that, the public will actually accept that. And we see that on the rare occasions when they do. There was a big Education Reform Act a couple years ago. It achieves immediate widespread acceptance. And then we fall back into the same patterns. So we've looked at essentially two large areas where we think philanthropy can make a difference in moving this forward. First is a set of institutions inside Congress. Power in Congress, for historical reasons, has been centralized at the leadership level. The leadership in a closely divided electorate is always looking at the next election. They could lose their house in any given election. They do not have time to focus on policy, and so they kill it. If you, at the committee level, people, if I spend all my time, I'm a Democrat, I'm a Republican, I'm on the banking committee, I like spent a lot of time learning about banking. I want to do something good for banking. Right, so the leader has taken that power away from me. But if you can get it re-decentralized, you have much more capacity to achieve compromise at that level. Uh, second, relationships have disappeared within Congress. People literally don't know each other. I have met Democrats who not only do they not know any Republicans, they don't even know all their fellow Democrats. They're spending so little time. They're spending so much time on fundraising and so on. So they, we need to rebuild their relationships, and in particular, bipartisan relationships. The norms that made this institution operate have been collapsing for years. So democratic politics presupposes political combat, but it's supposed to be like Fight Club, right? Or, you know, Marquess of Queensbury rules. We're not actually out to kill each other. And those rules, the rules that constrain the politics, as they disappear, it becomes even easier to abandon other ones. And that's what we've seen. So we need to rebuild the norms. Now, how do you do that? It's a standard kind of game theory problem. We know from game theory that if a cooperative regime breaks down, you have to play tit for tat until both sides realize nobody wins this way. You never go back to the old norms. You need new norms. So right now, they're doing tit for tat. right? And we're actually OK with that, because the Republicans need to learn that actually they're not going to win using the kinds of tactics that they used when Obama was president. If they do win, we have a serious problem. But right now, very little is actually getting done. 
uh, believe it or not, that is sort of a good thing because it hopefully will drive them to the point where they say, okay, we need to do something different. Our role in the meantime is to develop the kinds of norms that they can adopt when they are ready. So we're looking at three areas in particular. The budget process, it is completely broken. Both sides know they need a budget process. They know that's the core responsibility of Congress. One was developed in the 70s that has broken down. So we have been working with groups on both sides and members in Congress to develop a new budget process that hopefully at some point soon they would be ready to adopt. In fact, in the recent tax bill, as awful as it, as it was on substance, our grantees succeeded in getting a provision for the creation of a joint committee to develop a new budget process. We're doing the same thing on oversight. We're doing the same thing around cybersecurity, which is one of the issues that's not yet deeply politicized. And the idea is if we can achieve some successes there, nothing succeeds like success, and we can begin to rebuild norms in the same way that they were broken down in the first place. So that's a long-term strategy, but if we can begin to do it, we can begin to get, give Congress the opportunities to be functional. Now that's not enough, because a lot of the pressures come from outside Congress and the electoral system. So in particular, we know we have a huge problem with campaign finance. I won't go into it at length, but it obviously needs to be reformed. We need to free the candidates from high dependency on highly ideological, high net worth interests. And in the US in particular, we have this system of primary elections. Five to 10% of the voters on each side are turning out for the primaries. So that means candidates are being picked by the most extreme elements of their parties. And it doesn't matter whether the district is competitive in the general election or not. So we need to solve that problem. And we're looking at things like ranked choice voting, multi-member districts, other devices to increase voter turnout in primaries. Again, the details, which are interesting and complicated, the point is simply there are these levers that we can push to begin the process we think of renormalizing politics. We're not going to do that by ourselves. There's a million other things that have to fall into place. But we see the role of this is what you talk about long-term high-risk philanthropy, because we could just fail utterly here. But nobody else is going to try. No other institutions or organizations are in the position that we are to, to do this kind of work. And it does seem like at least a potentially uh, hopeful path. How are we going to measure success? Well, that one's fairly straightforward in this, right? So we're looking at what is the degree to which committees are being re-empowered to develop the legislation through the regular order? Uh, to what extent are new procedures being adopted? To what extent are members of both sides participating in the relationship building um, uh, devices that we're putting into place? How many bipartisan bills are being proposed? And most importantly, where does public confidence sit with the institution as a whole? Historically, support for Congress in the US bounced between 30 to 50%. It's always been a little low. But at the really functional periods, it, actually, that's actually a good thing. You know, if, if confidence is like 90%, you're probably a tyranny because um, your polls probably aren't realistic. Like, there's always the degree of cynicism in, Democrat, in a real democracy. So 30 to 50% is what it historically had been. You know, that's a big range, but were we at war? How was the economy? Who's the president? It now bounces between 5 and 15%. So we're looking, if we can get back into the 30 to 50% range, we will feel like we have accomplished something. Then we can start turning to all of the other problems that need to be addressed within the country, because we'll have a functional institution. Um, now note, by the way, this whole thing is itself incomplete because there are two other major issues to address if we're going to save liberal democracy. One is the problem of digital disinformation. I think don't need to explain that. And the other is the problem of getting beyond neoliberalism, which is to say we're also in a situation where on the left and the right, there's a dearth of ideas for productive disagreement. So we this this you know historically uh, disagreement takes place within an overarching shared paradigm which changes over time. It was mercantilism in the 18th century, and then laissez-faire in the 19th century, and Keynes in the mid 20th century, and then what we call neoliberalism or market fundamentalism or Milton Friedman in the late 20th century, and these idea sets work while they explain the world to people well enough so that they can develop solutions to their problems. They're never right or wrong. They're just better or worse as explanations. And then they run out as explanations, and they need to be replaced. So Keynes was replaced by Milton Friedman in the 70s and 80s because, in fact, that kind of top-down government management was not working very well for people. Society was coming apart at the seams, and the economy was not being managed very well. The sort of free market orthodoxy worked for people. It seemed to, anyway, enough for them to embrace it. And we're now at the other end of that, where those ideas are themselves creating the problems while offering no solutions. Global free trade, um, 
the one thing you know for sure is the emergence of AI and machine learning is not going to be solved through free market mechanisms. That's going to highly exacerbate the kind of wealth inequality the neoliberalism tends to produce. But we don't have an alternative yet. So those are problems that need to be addressed as well. They're complex. We are actually working on both of those. They have their own goals, their own theories of change and measures for progress. And there's no time for that here. I must be running short. Um, all I'll say is that you should be worrying about this too. <laughs> Right now, as I said, how to do that isn't something in Australia isn't something I can talk about. But do not take your democracy for granted, and do not treat it. This is the biggest problem philanthropy often has. Do not treat democracy as nothing more than a means to an end. All right, many of the funders we're working with on democracy issues do not see democracy itself as the end of what they're trying to protect. They have policy goals that they're trying for, and they see fixing the democratic problems as a means to that end. And the problem with that is it tends to exacerbate the polarization. You have to understand that, that 2,000 years of history, we developed something really precious and special that is under threat and that we have a role to play in helping to fix it. But that means understanding that we may need to put aside our short-term policy goals in order to fix this thing, which is essential in the long run for really getting people the kinds of solutions that they're gonna need in a durable and enduring way. Otherwise, whatever wins you get are likely to be short-term and undone when the political winds change, or worse, when the ability to speak through democratic means disappears. And as I say, do not assume that that is not possible. It's just Read a little history. A lot of people have made that assumption, and they've all been wrong in the past. OK, equally critical issue that I'm going to wrap up on, I'll just say a few words on is climate change, right? Because it's another, they call this a wicked problem. I hate that phrase, too. But it is certainly a complex problem. So let me just make a few points for you all to consider on climate. OK, the seriousness of this problem obviously can no longer be questioned, at least, honestly, not by anybody who's a serious person. <laughs> The evidence for climate change is by now so overwhelming and so consistent that it takes a true effort of the will to deny it. Um, what to me is most interesting is we've now had enough time with the climate models that we have actual data to show that they actually work. And what's scariest is they work in the following way, which is within the models, which work by predicting ranges, the temperature rise itself is at the low end of the range, and the consequences are at the high end, which means, if anything, we are underpredicting the scale of the problems that we're going to be facing. And the consequences, if we don't succeed on climate, and by succeed, I mean keeping it, I'll, I'll settle for two degrees, much less Paris is well below two degrees. The consequences, if we don't succeed, are extreme, right? Massive heat, we, we've seen the first little bits of it, heat waves in the 120s, imagine that being usual and common across the globe. Fires, we've been experiencing a lot of them in California, but wildfires, wherever there are forests, become, again, pretty common events. Floods and storms, like some of the major storms that we've seen. And all of this, of course, translates into money. It wrecks your economy. Um, migration. So think of Syria as a piker compared to what we're going to see when temperatures rise above two degrees. Massive migrations, which are going to put enormous pressure on all of our political structures. Food production. Uh, coral's already dying. Uh, when it completely dies off, that's about a $150 billion a year industry that disappears, as well as many of our food supplies. Uh, agricultural production on staples goes down by about 20%. Um, because of the shifts that take place. Now, we'll perhaps still be able to do this, but again, if you want, just translate it into money. Everything is going to become more expensive, which, of course, who's going to suffer from that are the poor, the people least capable of dealing with it. Um, the costs of physical adaptation in cities are literally incalculable. So our focus on mitigation now is not because the problems aren't already here and we could use some adaptation, but it's that the amount of adaptation is going to be exponentially greater if we don't take these last few years to achieve the mitigation goals that we have. And the political consequences of all this then are it's not only going to undo whatever progress you think you're making on all of your other issues, whatever your issue is, but more, right? If, you're, if your concern is poverty, if your concern is inequality, if your concern is, I almost don't care what it is, whatever it is, the political pressures that, that climate change is going to put on it are going are to move us backwards by some, by some amount. And yet it's an achievable goal. 
if we have the support we need. The truth is the climate movement, I know I'm going a little long, but I gotta say this, the climate movement, philanthropy movement to date is actually I think one of the most successful in history. 10 years ago when climate philanthropy was really started with the launch of Climate Works in 2007, we were on a steady track to five to six degrees warming by the end of this century. We are now on a track for some, between pledges made and actions already taken, if we can fulfill the pledges, somewhere between 2.7 and 3.3. Now, when you think about the fact that the entire globe runs on fossil fuels or ran on fossil fuels, that is an incredible achievement. It's just not enough yet. So as I like to say, we are winning the fight on climate, just not fast enough. So that last degree is going to be uh, much harder than the first one, but there's no reason to think we can't do it. We have the strategies, we have the grantees, we have the technologies. Literally, the only thing we're missing from the philanthropic side is the resources to do all of the things that need to be done. Because there's not one path. There's multiple paths, and we have to try them all because we're not quite sure which combination is going to work. And yet, at present, only 2% of global philanthropy is focused on climate. How is that possible? So here's a thought experiment, and then I'll leave you with that. Imagine the world as it's going to look in 2100 if we don't succeed existed today. So imagine that those 120 degree heat waves were common right now. Imagine that the superstorms were happening all through the storm season everywhere in the world with the damage that they cause. Imagine that you had massive migrations on the lines of what's going on in Syria happening all through Africa and Asia and, and you know, uh, putting pressure on all of the other countries in the world. Imagine food production declining and food costs going up uh, and on and on and on. Imagine that was all happening today and somebody came to you and said, if you'll put some of your philanthropy into this, you can make this stop. Who wouldn't do that? We would all do that. We would divert our resources. Whatever we're doing, we would divert at least some of our resources to solving that problem. So why doesn't it happen? I, I have to believe that it's because it's not going to happen for 60 or 80 years. And so people, it doesn't feel immediate in the sense that it is. But it's like if I drop a ball, it's going to hit the ground. <laughs> So we're now at the ball dropping phase. The stuff we're putting in the atmosphere, is, it, it's a mechanical process. It is going to cause these consequences unless we can stop it. So we have to do that now. We can't do it later. The costs later are going to be vastly larger. So it's pennies on the dollar now in order to stave off a problem that it's not, it's your children, it's your, my children at least, uh, and my grandchildren. They're going to bear the consequences of this if we don't fix it. So those are the kinds of challenges we face. And those are the kinds of challenges where we can make a difference as long as we think about doing it intelligently. They are immense challenges, but then so are the opportunities. We actually, as a group, have a chance to do something that very, very few humans in all of history ever get the chance to do, which is make the lives of billions of people better. Now, as I said at the beginning, I hate when people in philanthropy talk like that. You know, we're going to bend the arc of history towards justice. But on these problems, we can actually do that. No one's going to remember us. We won't be the people in the history books. But we have the opportunity to participate in something that really matters on that kind of scale. And and so that's, I, th I think, the challenge that we all face and that I put to you. Thank you. Okay. I'd I'm happy to take a couple of questions. I think I ran out much of my time, but there's time for at least a couple. So can I, we've got mics coming around, please would you just really quickly introduce yourselves and I'm going to be really bossy, please keep it to a question and short and snappy so that we can get through a few. So please wave at me if you've got questions and comments here, thank you. We've got mics coming from Christian and anybody else line up the next one after that, any waving? Thank you Joe. Uh, and at the back, stripy top, sorry, can't see, lights in my eyes, thank you. Nice top. <laughs> Good morning, thank you, that was a great presentation. You referenced high net worth individuals with high influence and their uh, influence on the electorate and public policy, uh, some of it quite pernicious. Can you uh, talk about how we address the question of the lack of accountability that those that that type of philanthropy is uh, putting before us. Well, so um, I, there is a relatively straightforward solution at this point, which is just serious public financing. Um, in the U.S., 
uh, right now there's a lack of political will for that. And right now you have the Supreme Court standing in the way of almost every other solution. There are lots of ways to think about addressing it. So as I say, it, it itself is a political problem that requires a political solution. This is gonna sound awful. When Justice Scalia died, this is really awful. Um, I, I was a constitutional historian. There's a famous story in the US when Brown v. the Board of Education was first argued in 1952. Fred Vinson was the chief justice, and he supported segregation. And it looked like the court at least would be split, but might actually uphold segregation. And in the middle of the case, Fred Vinson died suddenly of a heart attack. And Felix Frankfurter was quoted as saying that it was the first and only evidence he'd ever seen that there might actually be a god out there. <laughs> And I wrote a memo to my board after Scalia passed away, and I quoted that story. Um, unfortunately, as you know, the appointment process didn't work the way we did, so, the way we had hoped. So we have a Supreme Court that stands firmly in the way of any sort of regulation, reasonable regulation of campaign finance. So we're going to have to figure out a solution to that problem in the US. But you know, if you're not bound by the extreme libertarian free speech doctrines that we have and just have kind of reasonable libertarian free speech doctrines. There's all sorts of ways, you know, I think a lot of the things that are done in, in, in Europe um, work reasonably well and, and a serious system of public financing would work perfectly well. We know we can do that. Uh, Joe Skrinsky, Sky Foundation. Uh, you've made a terrific rousing call on climate. Can you give us some of the practical approaches Hewlett is taking to actually work on that? Sure. So there's an array of things that need to be done. So first, there's completing the efforts which are already underway and, and moving along rather well. And that is the finishing the, electric, the uh, shift to renewable energy for the production of electricity, um, completing the electrification of the transportation fleet, um, so those are sort of two relatively easy ways. The progress there, by the way, we're now at the point where it's not so much government regulation that we need as financial investment. So our focus for the next stage going forward is we need about a trillion dollars a year invested. Um, and there are various things that philanthropy can do to build the infrastructure necessary to unleash that investment. So that's one set of activities. Um, second, we know we need to make a lot of progress around what are called negative emissions, which is essentially carbon capture and storage, agricultural reform, and forestation, deforestation issues. So again, there are strategies in place for all those. We have the science, we have the technology, we just lack the resources that we need to move those strategies along. There's a split within the movement although at Hewlett we are firmly of the belief that nuclear has a role to play. And again, we're at a point where we just, the technologies are in process. They need a sort of final push to get to the kind of modular nuclear that can be done relatively cheaply and much, much, much more safely uh, than has been done in the past. Um, what am I missing? Uh, I had written this down somewhere. Um, oh, and then the other key area where we think we need to begin moving forward is we know South Asia, Southeast Asia and Africa are future large emitters, unless we can get there now and help them leapfrog that. And there's no activity right now to speak of in those countries. So those are the main areas where if, if we can sort of line all those things up, we think we can, we think we can get there pretty easily. Easily is an overstatement, but we think we can get there. I'm happy to, we have this whole thing developed. Anybody is interested, we can put you in. There's a group of funders who have been working on this where we have all of the materials and the strategies and the grantees and we're about to hopefully launch a kind of fundraising effort to bring in more philanthropic resources around this. There's room, it's one of these things where there are lots of funders but not enough and it's a place where large or small you can help make a really big difference by being part of you know, what, as I say, will be the most important philanthropic effort in history if we succeed. Um, hi, my name's Genevieve Fitzgerald. I'm from the Mercy Health Foundation. Thank you so much. It was a fabulous overview and a great reality check. I'm particularly interested in the um, climate change discussion and the link to open resource sharing. I know um, I have a daughter working in sustainability behaviour change in a commercial system. And she's just moved to New York and she's facing a um, confidential disclosure agreement thing. And one of the comments is she cannot share any of her learnings with any other company she moves on into the future. And we were literally this morning talking about it on the phone, about how are we going to get best practice when someone makes an innovation and it's not in the philanthropic sort of value space, but the corporate more competitive space. With the challenges we have and the limited time we have, how can philanthropy engage the corporates to be more open in their sharing and learning as they implement sustainability change? 
So I, I missed the particular example, just because oh, well, we were speaking quietly. But okay, sorry. Um, I guess the question is, can philanthropy in some way be a lever to help the corporates embed and also open their best practice in the yeah. ways we're responding to climate change? Yeah, I, you know, so there's not an answer to that other than we have to engage and we have to work with them and it's, it's one-offs. So um, I'll give you an example in a different domain which is the digital disinformation domain, where we have this huge problem and the ability to diagnose or work on it is because all of the data and information is held by private companies who have both good and bad reasons for not wanting to release it. We were able, by working closely with Facebook, to come together around an agreement where they have now released their data for independent research uh, with no pre-publication review. But it was, a, it was a long process of really working with them to allay their various fears and speak to their legitimate concerns. So I think it's doable, but it, does, it's, it's, it requires really getting into the trenches and engaging with the particular concerns of the particular company. I don't think there's any other way to think about doing that successfully in the time frame that we're talking about. Lucky last, Sophie at the back. Thanks, Larry. It's Sandy Shaw from the Newsboys Foundation. I'm interested in your thoughts around the role of the free press and independent journalism in relation to the future of democracy. <laughs> it has one. You know, I mean, I think there's so uh, so there's no question, right, that uh, that a free press and free speech generally are essential for any kind of flourishing democracy. Okay, that, that there's nothing much more to say than that. It's clearly a truism. I, I actually think the major threat. There are two major threats to that now. Um, one is the financial model itself. So that has nothing to do with the polarization, with Trump, with any of that other stuff. It is that there was a lot of pressure because of technological innovation around how to sustain uh, really strong independent media. Um, and there are solutions being developed to that. The nonprofit media are emerging, uh, new forms of partnership and so on. So I think we can solve that problem in the long run. Um, the digital disinformation problem is, is of a different nature. The, the truth is, this is a kind of golden age. Certainly in the US, it is definitely a golden age for the media. There is a ton of amazing work being done by journalists. The problem is not that. It's that it's being drowned out by this sea of propaganda that has been generated by technological change. So when I had this conversation with my board, I said to them, imagine it's 1964, and somebody comes to you and says, you know, Lyndon Johnson is running a child trafficking ring out of a pizza parlor, let's get this story out. So in 1964, how would you have done that? Well, you could self-publish and 10 people would see it because you couldn't have reached a mass audience. There were extremist outlets that would have published your thing. The John Birch Society had the Watchtower. The Communist Party had a paper. They would have run your story. But the only people who would have seen it were people who were willing to go out of their way to go find those things, and that tended to be a relatively small number of extremists. If you wanted to reach the mass public, you had to go through your CBS, NBC, New York Times organizations, and they curated it, and they would have shown you the door. They wouldn't have run that story. So what's happened with technology and that's because they were both producers and distributors of the news. They had both functions. So in their production function, they curated, and in their distribution function, that meant you didn't get to anybody. The internet comes along. Now I can produce that story at a pretty high level of quality myself very cheaply, and by putting it on the internet and through the social media who have subsumed the distribution function, I can reach a mass audience. So mainstream media is still being produced. There's as much good journalism as ever, or if not as much as ever, there is plenty of good journalism. And people are reading it, the data shows. The problem is they are also being surrounded by a sea of propaganda, and propaganda works. And so the, the polarization is not that people aren't reading the New York Times or the Washington Post. It's that alongside of it, they're reading Breitbart or the Daily Cause or whatever, you know, Infowars or whatever crazed thing there is out there. And it's, and it's working on many, many people. So the problem we need to solve to, to secure the role of the free press is what would you do if it was 1923 and somebody said, you can shut down the Nazi propaganda machine? Would you have done it? I, I, I would have. I will say, free speech notwithstanding, right? The consequences are such. So I'm not prepared to just shut them all down, but we're gonna have to come up with a solution. We have 20th century speech norms that rested on 20th century technology. The implicit cost benefit allowed us to indulge in norms that had really broad protections for even the worst speech because the truth was the vast majority of people were never gonna see it. And now they're all seeing it and it's eroding fundamental institutions in the society and we need a solution 
solution to that problem. So the preservation of a free press is both solving the economic problem, which I think we can do, and solving the propaganda problem, which we don't have answers to yet. Sorry, but we are going to have to bring That's that okay. to a close. Thank Please you. Thank Larry. I'm sorry, it's, it's horrible stopping the conversation. Um, Larry, when Christian and I were dreaming about sort of people to bring out last year for the conference, your name was Top of the Pops, and then we went, no, I'll never come. And then like half an hour later, she's like, oh, should we ask him? Anyway, we asked him, he said yes, so we did a dance around the office, now you know why. Larry, thank you so much for coming and sharing that with us. And I just, I can feel Karen's ESP vibes in my brain, Sandy, about a plug for then the Democracy and Media breakout session later. I was right, wasn't I? Yeah. She's looking at me going, say it, say it, say it.